All right, everybody. These are, well, hello, this is Earl. And uh, these are my notes to Janine, which is a Duke Pearson composition, uh, most notably recorded by Cannonball Adderley on Them Dirty Blues. And uh, right now I've got that there on. Uh, I was kind of compiling my notes and I'm down there, so Janine is already long gone. But a couple of notes uh, that I hope you know, might, you know, add some insight to everything that you guys brought to the table already, and just some things that, you know, stick with me about this tune. Uh, regarding form, I guess we'll start there. This is going to be module 2-2. Two, two. Um, I think for a tune like this, uh, it's one that I would consider, I, I saw a, a lot of analyses, excuse me, A, B, A, B, C, uh, all that, and that all makes sense. Um, for me, I'm going to call this AABA with 16 bar A sections and then the 8 bar bridge, which by my public school math puts me, this is before Common Core now, this puts me at 56 bars, which would handle module 2-6. So um, something, and you know, I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with Duke Pearson, uh, great, great composer and arranger, had a tremendous big band, um, great pianist as well, uh, but definitely somebody that if you're, especially, I mean, you, I think you guys know by now I'm a big band junkie. If you haven't checked out Introducing the Duke Pearson Orchestra, uh, that's definitely one uh, to get your hands on. Um, probably, man... I don't want to go down to Duke Pearson rabbit hole because I could talk Duke Pearson for a while, but uh, I guess the one that you would have to check out would be uh, the chart on tones for Jones Bones. Um, and, you know, offhand, I can't remember if it's Marvin Stam or Randy. I think it's Randy Brecker playing it. Um, but, I mean, the band just sounds tremendous. And uh, definitely somebody, if you're not too familiar with, I would I would get familiar with. Um, okay. A uh, couple of points in regards to the modules that we have set up. I'm going to go to module 3-4, and this is for rhythm section involvement. Um, on the Cannonball version, there's not a lot of cuts of people playing Janine. You know, it's a, I don't want to say it's an obscure tune, but um, it's not like you're playing Blues for Alice or Good Bait or anything like that. You type that in and you got, you know, a ton of versions. Uh, you're kind of limited to just the Cannonball take, which is in my opinion, a great thing. It's kind of one of those one of these gem tunes that's just waiting to be you know, played by a, a bunch of cats. Um, but that said, the rhythm section involvement on this recording, uh, the pianist comping the figure, the exact figure of the melody, eight bars in advance. The rhythm section has something specific to play on this. And you can hear throughout, whether it's the improvisations or throughout the tune, that especially the opening bar, bop, 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 that is a very, very prominent figure in the comping, obviously in the melody because it is the melody. Uh, so I feel like the rhythm section here, especially the pianist, the bass is obviously walking and the drums are just driving time. But the pianist has a specific rhythm to play and not just a specific rhythm, but the rhythm of the melody, which is something, again, to put in your arsenal. Um, module 4-4. Four to four. This is Bright to Dark Harmony. And I have a note in here through diatonicism. Um, this tune, right, A-flat minor, if we're looking at this diatonically, A-flat minor is, in the classical sense, really the three chord in the key of E, which is where we get to a 2-5 and E after this 8-bar vamp in A-flat. So while we're vamping on A-flat minor, the 2-5 to major is definitely going to have a brightness to it, right? We're going from a minor sound, brightening up to major. And I find it interesting that it's all done through diatonicism. It's a 3 chord with 2-5-1. So we're generating modality, a bright to dark, but through the use of it being all diatonic in the same key. Module 4-8. Uh, that one is... Oh, uh, the harmonic rhythm of this, right? The balance between the vamping 8-bar, 8-flat, which a lot of you obviously commented on. 
Uh, but you know, a, a great tool to keep with you is something like this, where you have a, a section of almost stagnant harmony where it just parks in A flat, and then eight bars later gets back into harmony moving bar by bar. Now, that's a really that's a wonderful device. Excuse me, that's in this tune. Um, four nine tonal centers. Something that um, I, I think it was William pointed out in his analysis, which is really wonderful, is uh, how there's a clear tonal center of A flat minor for the first eight bars. And then as we get to the cadence of the first section, it cadences in the key of A flat major, the realization of parallel minor to major. Um, it's not a new trick. I mean, how many examples do we have of that? You know, Beethoven in the Seventh Symphony, in the second movement, which is a pretty popular movement. Um, you know, the idea of, in that example, it's in, uh, I think it's in A minor. Um, there's an instance in the C section of that where uh, the harmony moves from major to minor in the same measure. It's a really slick harmonic device how, you know, at least in that example, how Beethoven shifts from parallel. Uh, and then the same thing, it's a little delayed here. It's eight bars later. But the idea of resolving, or I should say, creating a tonal center of minor to parallel major is pretty slick. I like that. Um, 410, the harmonic peak. As I was just saying, this is really diatonic if we if we get our theory hats on here. I think... You know, I, th I would feel pretty comfortable saying we identify as improvisers. We identify a flat minor as the, kind of the sound of these eight bars and not really the three chord of this. But our theory hats, if we put them on, we can kind of back our way into it. This chord right here, the A7 sharp 11 chord, this is the first time that we leave this tonal center of E, right? Whether it be parked in A flat minor or the 2-5 to E. Right here on the improvisation, on the melody, this for me is a clear spot of a harmonic peak. And Denny uses the example uh, of the blues in the eighth bar about how, uh, you know, whatever key you're in, that dominant chord on the sixth or the secondary dominant going to the two minor chord, uh, how it generates a lot of, you know, uh, excitement. There's a lot of. Um, tension on that chord. I identify this bar in particular on a chart like this as one that creates that harmonic peak. And we get it three times. And it also kind of is nice because we get the chromaticism heading up to B flat minor. But this bar right here is one that if I were playing on this tune, I would definitely kind of be licking my chops for something uh, right around here to really identify that sound of A dominant 7. Um... 5-2 and 5-3. This is under melodic analysis. Um, lyrical is 5-2. I would identify the first eight bars of this melody as lyrical. right? I don't, I, I don't know if there's words to this tune. If there are any, I haven't heard them. But, uh, you know, the concepts that at least Dead wrote in, not very noty, um, repetitive. Um, I would say that the first eight bars kind of tie into that. You know, very straight ahead. Somebody could put words to them. And then when you get into these last eight bars, I kind of find it to be a little bit more of the line writing, where it's not necessarily repetitive. Not that it's a bop head, but I would say you're kind of leaning more towards that way. But when you put it in those terms, how you take something that's very lyrical uh, or very simple and juxtapose that with something that's line based or a lot more involved. I think that's a really cool way to craft a melody. Granted, it's 16 bars. Uh, if you if you look at the form that way, under that AABA -A -A umbrella, but it's a pretty slick, I guess, combination of something that's sparse and something that's line written, um, or something that's maybe a little bit more intense rhythmically. So I think that's a you know a pretty cool thing about this tune as well. Um, so that's what I have on Janine. I thank you for all of your submissions. And again, I hope any of this stuff uh, turns out to be helpful for you in your own analysis as you guys keep moving forward. All right, everybody. Thank you.